everyone, and welcome back to Claim Your Potential, the Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Sophie, and for this episode, we are joined by Genevieve Paturo to discuss everything you need to know to start a nonprofit from how to build a board, attract and retain volunteers, scale a nonprofit, and other best practices. Genevieve is a best selling and award winning author, inspirational speaker, and founder of the Pajama Program. She is all about purpose and the human connection. She was a successful television marketing executive until 2001 when she jumped off the corporate ladder and founded the hugely successful national nonprofit Pajama Program. This year, the program celebrates its 21st anniversary, having delivered more than 7 million magical gifts of new pajamas and new books to children through its 42 chapters across the U.S. Please welcome Genevieve. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Sophie. And I don't know if you know this, but this is something that we have been announcing, at least on our end, is Claim Your Potential is becoming a nonprofit. And so this episode is really hitting close to home already because I'm excited to not only pick your brain, but also so a lot of our listeners can hear a little bit about your story and you know how you run your organization and some of those best practices and that motivation that you have that keeps you going. So my first question for you is, what do you wish you knew before you started your nonprofit? Probably I'm glad I didn't know what I didn't know, because I think I'm like a lot of people. I would have scared myself right out of doing what my heart was telling me to do. So I I guess I would have I would have wanted to know that anything I was afraid to ask was was something that. I shared with many people, asking is hard. Asking makes you feel dumb. Asking makes you feel like you don't know anything. Asking makes you vulnerable. I knew all that, but I wish I had known that people wanted and want to help and that we don't, we shouldn't feel any of those things because it's something that unfortunately we all can relate to. So I think it's, it's really important to, to know that the human connection, which I talk about all the time, is there for our support. People naturally want to help and want to ask questions, especially when they know the answers. So every time I was brave enough to ask a question about something I didn't know, I was met with not only an answer, but lots of advice and enthusiasm from the person who knew more about what I needed to know about than I did. Absolutely. I think just Asking the question is always the hard part. And I think that's something that I've noticed not only in just in life in general, but also as I'm trying to to build claim your potential into a nonprofit is, yeah, there's so many moments where I don't know how to do a certain paperwork or there's something that I know I need to file, but I have no idea how to start on it. And so rather than trying to, you know, sit there and rack my brain and you know, my head is spinning in circles. And rather than doing that, I have contacts that I know, know how to do it. So I'd rather, and that's, you know, something that I enjoy doing is asking, Hey, I know you're in this sector. If, you know, if there's, if you have a, you know, a couple minutes that we could maybe chat about this, I would love to, to hear your expertise. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Is people love to talk about what they know. And so nine times out of 10, someone always will say, Oh yeah, absolutely. I have time this week. Let's go get a coffee and and figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why we're built or we're wired to be so afraid to ask. I mean, I, I know the reasons I I said earlier that we feel, you know, dumb or we feel vulnerable, but it's something that we all share. And the more that we are brave enough to ask questions, the more, like you say, people pop up wanting to help. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what are the top three things other than I'm assuming definitely having someone that you know that can help you out with some of the the paperwork or someone that's in the sector that can help you out just trying to navigate some of the the expertise involved. But what are the top three things a nonprofit should have out of the gates other than that? Well, I would say a very committed and more ways than one, very committed founder who is willing to to go the extra mile every day, every hour, every day. Somebody who feels a very, has a very heart connection 
to the reason why he or she is is starting this nonprofit personal experience, something that in the hardest of times you can remember and bring right up front and say, it's for these kids. I remember that day. I know this child. I know that person who is suffering. I can help. Some Something in us, founders, gives us the strength and the courage to wake up on the hardest day, on the day we have to ask for more money, on the day we're on the brink of losing some money, on the day we're all alone and we're exhausted. We all need that commitment, that passion, that reason that we know this is our purpose. This is our North Star. And I know, and, and that person has to believe that we're given the that purpose, that choice, because we all have a choice, and it's supported, supported by wh- whoever you believe in, the universe, the, your God, your inner being. But it's sort of that invisible place where inspiration comes to us that gives us that assurance that because that came to us, it's ours to do and everything we need will show up. Absolutely. And then are there other, maybe another two things that a nonprofit should have outside of the gates other than a dedicated, passionate founder? Yes, technical help. So for me, when I started, I needed somebody who was a CPA or at least a bookkeeper to start and an attorney. So yeah, one absolutely. emotional piece and two practical pieces. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm running into that now where just the amount of legal jargon I have to sift through is insane. So yeah, I could not recommend more to anyone having a lawyer. And then yeah, of course, someone to help you figure out accounting and like setting up QuickBooks and and things along those lines. So thank you so much for sharing that. And then in terms of support for the founder, building a board is crucial for any nonprofit success, and especially the ability for the the founder, the executive director to be able to 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 best serve. So how can someone effectively recruit board members who are passionate and committed to the cause? That's a tricky, not tricky question. It's a tricky process for founders who are leading with heart because we naturally tend to ask friends. We we aren't always the best best people to ask advice or ask support of strangers. So we lean toward friends who don't always make the best board members. Now, they can at the start. So for me, I asked friends. I found out through my lawyer I needed three. And I asked a couple of friends who said, sure, because they didn't even know what a board member does. I didn't educate them because I wanted to get this done. So in the, in the experience that I had in going from three friends to a couple of strangers that contacted me because they saw something I was doing with a flyer or something, and they were interested. I was quick to say, would you like to join our board? And they pretty quickly said, sure. So there we were, a group of individuals forming a board that didn't know what it really meant and didn't know, again, the commitment that was, you know, inherent in the bylaws that you have to submit and and all that to the government. So a lot of us learn trial and error. It's hard to ask friends for money. It's hard to ask friends to do things. They, and I didn't make it clear that this wasn't just for fun and games, that this was to raise money, that wasn't easy, and to plan strategies and make a, you know, make a budget and all of that fun, not so fun stuff. So I think when I mentor people who are starting nonprofits, I tell them up front, at the most, one friend, and know why you're asking that friend, and have a frank conversation with that friend, the way you would the next group that you're going to bring on who are strangers or who have something that you need and want to exchange it for their purpose that, that's aligned with what your purpose is. So it's it's hard because a lot of founders are emotional before we're business leaders. And if that's the case, then they need to really investigate boards, talk to people who have served on boards and find out what it means so that they don't find themselves in an awkward position 
of having uncomfortable conversations with friends. Absolutely. I think that that was the same advice that was given to me. And I'm very thankful for that because as I've gone through the the board development process is I made sure that I, you know, put it on LinkedIn, that I did outreach to people beyond my immediate circle. And yeah, I, I mean, I echo that statement in that it will serve you in the long run to pick people that are not just invested in you as a person, which is what happens when you bring friends on, but people that are invested in the mission. And that's really where that lies in terms of having a board that is motivated and committed because not only do they believe in you, but they believe in what you're doing. And so it is easier for them, at least in what I've seen so far, is that when you have a board that's committed to the mission, specifically the mission, is it's easier for development. It's easier to to fundraise because they're like, hey, this is what I'm passionate about. So therefore, I'm going to go out and make sure that I'm building connections for the organization, that I'm that I'm developing fundraising goals and, and events because I believe in what this organization is doing versus, as you were saying, having friends on that are like, well, you know, sure, I'll help you out. And then they're committed maybe the first couple months, maybe even the first six months. And then they, you know, sort of fizzle out as they're like, well, you know, I, I love you as a person, but I just don't have the same drive for this organization. So, I mean, absolutely. I could not agree more with what you said there. And I think so much of where the power is, is impact. And it's the impact that board members want to make and that they know your organization can make. And so I'm curious as to how can nonprofits measure and communicate their impact to stakeholders? Well, as you get, as you grow, it becomes more involved. Just to back to the board question, sometimes you get really super lucky. So I founded Pajama Program over 22 years ago, and I ran it for 20 years. So founder and executive director. And there was a board member along the way who was wonderful, became president of our board our board named Jamie. And she expressed interest early on that she wasn't really in love with her law degree. And if I ever wanted to not be the day-to-day, the executive director, that she'd be interested. So after 20 years, I wanted to write my book and I wanted to speak and teach and talk about finding your purpose and how we grew and use our story to inspire other people on the human connection and finding purpose, the magic of of those two, whether it's nonprofit or a business that you want to run or your own life. So Jamie became our executive director and has been running it for the last few years. Now she has it 20 years old. So in the first 20 years, it was it was a very different type of group to run, as you can imagine. So we had stories and that's what I loved to to tell people funder funders the stories of the kids, my story, how I met the little girl that changed everything, my stories of bringing some friends with me to meet the children, to give them new pairs of pajamas and new books just for them and how excited they'd be. And so those stories really brought in the volunteers, brought in the funders, brought people you know, to, to ask how they can help, brought more people to the board. All of that was was easy because it came naturally to me. Sure, I would tell them how many books and pajamas we were giving. I could tell them how many kids were on the wait list. I could tell them who they were, what circumstances that they were living in. But as you grow, there's more accounting and there it's a little more sophisticated. So I had to learn all of those, all of the pieces of the puzzle that would really help funders understand where their money was going in addition to making them feel that they were contributing to you know something warm and and wonderful and helping so the more money you want to raise sometimes the more they ask of you and Jamie's been doing a great job and I learned but she's much better at it on on finding those ways of showing the success in black and white not just in warm stories that tell the story so it does change as you grow so I always, I always tell people when they start to use the stories and the photos if they can and to bring p- funders or potential funders with you because generally people give from the heart and I believe they still do. But as you want to ask for more money, there are more people at a corporation that have questions. 
So that's a more comprehensive um, report that you want to give to them. And it, it's more than, you know, what I started with and how we grew to where we were. And now Jamie takes it, you know, to the next level. Absolutely. Yeah. I think also when you, you know, speaking to your point on starting off with, with that, that warm fuzzy, those stories, I think, especially when, you know, you have less of a client, less of a clientele or in terms of numbers, is it also, it, it really helps to drive your impact forward when you are just starting out, when you are a smaller organization versus, you know, when you're, you know, if you're trying to present that, you know, oh, let's say we have 10, 10 clients, I would rather, if I was a funder, I'd rather hear 10 testimonials or even five testimonials than having it be a numbers game of, oh, you've served 10 people. Well, that's great. But, you know, maybe I want to give my money to a larger organization that served more. And so I think that it's, you know, it's knowing when to use the numbers and when to use, when to use those, those points of impact, those testimonials, those stories. And then, yeah, absolutely. When it comes to, to grants and to strategic partnerships, oh yeah, they want to see the numbers. They, they might want maybe one or two quick testimonials, but it's all a numbers game for them. And so really, yeah, it's about, as you were saying, knowing when to use which and, you know, kind of judging your audience, but yeah, absolutely. Starting off with with that that warm fuzzy, that you know, storytelling, and you know, I think at least for you, you know, when you were when you, being the founder and getting it up from the ground running, I feel like for you, you know, having those stories rather than the numbers game ultimately would you know help convince people to get behind you to show people that hey, I'm passionate about this. Look what we've done. Um, and so I think that that's a, a fantastic way of, of approaching it kind of, I'm like the trajectory of starting off with testimonials and then kind of, you know, as time goes on shifting more towards, all right, let's look at the numbers, but yeah, absolutely prioritizing those firsthand accounts of the impact of your programs. Right. And no matter how many wonderful supportive numbers that you have, you need the stories too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm noticing this with I'm reading I was reading through some impact reports today and it's like, oh, twelve hundred children served, but there's no stories on their website from these children. There's no nothing like that. And so it's kind of like, well, I would love to donate. I'd love to help out, but I wanna know, am I helping Sally from Georgia who I, I don't know, whatever example, I wanna, you know, I wanna know. Right. Are you getting her a bed? Are you feeding her three children meals for a month? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people want to feel no matter how big you are, how much money you have, you want your money. You want to feel where you're, you're giving your money. Absolutely. And I think some of the most successful nonprofits have that fundraising approach where it, like you can donate to a specific person depending on the type of program and you can read, you know, the person's bio and you can read, you know, where they're from, their story, where the money's going to. And so I forgot which organization did this, but it's or like they have like sponsor, you can sponsor a specific panda with like World Wildlife Fund, I believe, or something like that, where you're, where you're directly giving, you feel like you're directly giving to that person, to that animal, to that cause rather than to the general organization. So right. I always found that to be a, a pretty cool approach to fundraising. I agree. I agree. So nonprofits rely I mean, we just talked about funding and nonprofits rely on funding to carry out their mission. But what are some creative ways to fundraise and generate revenue for a nonprofit? I know we just touched on one, but are there any others? I like the old fashioned way of bringing everyone together. I know there are lots of online ways to do it. And, you know, people are mixed about getting out. Some of us, you know, feel like we can give money in a lot of different ways. You don't need to be in a room. But when you are in a room, whether there are 10 people or 250 people, there's energy in that room. They're sharing stories. Why do you care about the organization? Who do you know here? What have you done? Oh, you volunteered? Oh, I've been meaning to volunteer. What was it like, you know, reading to the kids? What was it like when they were so excited they wanted to put the pajamas on right over their clothes? And it, you, you can't have that when you hit, you know, an online campaign button to donate. Not to say that there's not a place for everything. So I think that you, I think it's best to include some in-person energy to, to the fundraising because 
that's part of why people give to feel camaraderie, to maybe meet some of the people that they are helping, or at least meet the people who are closer to them than maybe they are. They're a funder to get some real stories, you know, to, to share, to ask questions in real time. And I think that I, it can be a little more expensive than doing something online and it can be hard to get all the people you want in a room. But I think to include an in-person event is really important to, to the energy, to the energy that you, you all feel. It's a lot of work. Believe me, I've done lots of them and it's a, it is a lot of work and, you know, you have to pay for holes and food and things like that. But there's nothing like a successful in-person event when people are are saying good night and and you have to push people out the door because they've enjoyed themselves and that you have more people to follow up with because oh I didn't know this happened and I met so and so who told me that I could have the opportunity to fold pajamas. I, I would love to do that. So I always, you know, I, I always try to encourage people not to give up on in person events because it really is very, very special. Absolutely. I think I mean with COVID at least so much got moved online and it and it did a real disservice to nonprofits because, I mean, I think that's where so much giving happens is those events. And it's people, you know, seeing people from the organization, talking to people from the organization. Maybe you even have previous clients, success stories there that that donors and, and constituents and stakeholders can talk to. And at least with where I've worked previously, I've seen the difference of having an online they have an annual fundraising event and they had it online one year and they had it again this year and an absolute difference in terms of of donations just an astronomical difference where people really want to be in person people want to see up close what's happening with the organization and where the money is going and the the impact that it has not only on the organization but the people it serves Right, right. And you don't have to have a fancy gala. Those are fun too, but you can have bowling. You know, we did a very successful bowling event in the recession years ago, and it didn't cost a lot and people needed to have fun. And although I thought, do people really bowl in New York City when (laughs) someone suggested that? I learned, yes, I learned that there is a bowling alley in New York City and people bowl. And I learned that it's fun and that it's inexpensive, especially when you have a small budget and times are hard. And people laugh and it, it brings, you know, it brings, it uplifts people and they know, they, they feel the difference and maybe they'll donate more. Maybe they'll tell more people, maybe they'll get, make a new friend, you know, there. And it's, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be fancy. Yeah. I mean, people appreciate the simple thing. So I think that if you can find something that's just, you know, just simple pleasure, simple fun. I, I love that bowling example. That's definitely something I haven't heard of. But I mean, that <laughs> seems pretty effective, though. I would totally go out to bowl with someone. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get it, but you know, there's a whole other story to that. But it was, it was an amazing lift for for those of us worried about recessions hold on nonprofits. Absolutely, and so much of what we're talking about. Um, is about scaling a nonprofit, building it up. So such as scaling it into a national organization, which is something that you did. And so scaling a nonprofit is important for reaching more people and making a greater impact. And so what are some strategies you have seen that work well in growing a nonprofit? Well, I think I think getting some professional help is good because a founder and sometimes an executive director, if the executive director is not the founder, might be too close to the situation to to really know the right direction or to not, may, maybe doesn't know that there are some choices. And somebody who is a professional in growing businesses or growing nonprofits can show you different ways and you can mix and match. So it's good to have somebody else's perspective. Now, about paying for that person, There are people that might volunteer who are, you know, who are growing their own business or who have grown a business and would be great to talk to. So it's, it doesn't mean it has to cost a lot of money, but it does mean that you get another perspective from somebody who has been successful in growing their business because nonprofits are businesses. Yes, it's wonderful. It's a whole, doesn't feel anything like a business when you begin, but it is. 
it is a business once you get your 501c3 and leading up to it. So I always tell people, get advice from business people. Absolutely. I I think that when you're in the nonprofit sector, it becomes so easy to only want to connect with people in the same sector, which is great. But at the same time, absolutely, the business industry has so much advice and also so many resources to use that 100% apply because you're right. It's the same structure. You still need funding. You still need to have governance. You still need to have you know, some sort of operation set up. You need to have an HR. You need, you know, like, there's all these different systems that you need to have the same way a business has. You need to have accounting. You need to have all of that set up. And so, yeah, I think that's some fantastic advice for our listeners to take away. And to wrap everything up, is there one thing that our listeners should take away from this whole conversation? If listeners, if the majority of your listeners are founders or want to f- start a nonprofit, I know that we all have our reasons and we all know exactly, or we think we know exactly how we want this to go. Invite other people to be part of the journey. Invite other people who share a passion for something that's related to what you're doing. So even if there wasn't somebody that exactly wanted to help children exactly the way I wanted to, many of our supporters loved what we were doing and they felt some connection to it. And that helped me grow. And inviting them in, their opinion, their help along the way, takes the pressure off you as a single leader. Because there's a lot of pressure on on any leader who's working by him or herself. And I think it's more for nonprofits because of the rules and because of the public wanting to know things and wanting you wanting to to please everyone and show the need because it's real and educate people on the need because they might not be aware. And I think by by keeping keeping to yourself and only relying on what you know and the way you always wanted it to be or want it to be limits us. And I had to learn, you know, I had to learn to ask for help. I had to learn that there were more ways in my way and that might've been better and faster. And, you know, I tripped and fell a bunch of times and I learned that, you know, oh yes, so-and-so did offer to help me and did suggest this other way, but I, you know, I didn't listen because I know the right way because this is my baby. And it's not always true. So, you know, back to your question, what did I know? I I wish I had known that I could still love my baby and be its, you know, its nurturer and the leader and still be open to, to inviting other people, you know, into this private, private home that I, I had for this you know, this loving journey that I was, that I was on. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's called founder syndrome where we just, we don't want anyone to touch it and it's, we don't want anyone to mess with it. And it's just, you know, it's so, you become so emotionally attached to, you're right, to your child, to your baby. And so, yeah, I think that's some wonderful advice to give all of our listeners, especially to those that are looking to start a nonprofit and to those that are currently in the industry. Maybe you've seen it firsthand from a founder that you know, or maybe you're experiencing it right now where, you know, you you just don't want to let go. It's 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 founder syndrome. It's your child. You don't want to to let people mess with it, to let people get involved. But you're absolutely right, Genevieve. You have to let people get involved. You have to let people help you. You have to let people, you know, give their advice. You might not always take their advice, but it's important to seek it out in the first place. And so thank you so much for sharing that and for coming onto the podcast today and sharing all of your wisdom. Oh, it's my pleasure. If anybody wants to have a a brainstorming or, or a conversation, I'm always open. Please share my information with them. Absolutely. I will have that in the episode description box as well as on our guest info page. So for anyone that's interested, feel free to reach out to Genevieve. And I think that's a wonderful resource that you're offering our listeners. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure, Sophie. Thank you so much for coming on and have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. That concludes this podcast episode. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying our show, You can also visit our website, claimyourpotential.com, to access our blog, listen to previous and future episodes, 
leave a review, and subscribe to our newsletter. For more content, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Claim Potential for inspiration, episode and blog post announcements, along with other content for you to reach your full potential. A free way to support our show is by leaving it a rating and review on the podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you're not sure how to do this, you can head over to the leave a review page on our website for instructions. Thank you everyone and tune in next time where we'll continue to learn how you can claim your potential.